Hello, today we are here outside the annual American Contact Dermatitis meeting in San Francisco, California. My name is Kristen Moad and I'm a dermatologist at Geisinger Medical Center and I am here with Sharon Jacob, who's an Associate Professor of Dermatology at Loma Linda. We're going to speak today about nickel allergy. Sharon, can you tell me uh, about nickel allergy, how common it is, and, and what the significance of it is? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for this. Um, so nickel um, contact dermatitis is actually the most prevalent allergic contact dermatitis that we see in patch-tested populations. That includes adults and children. Um, my area of interest lies um, in pediatric contact dermatitis, and I've been looking into these um, numbers, so to speak, for the last 10 years. In 2008, we saw the first big clinical trials coming out. Um, they're retrospective from the North American Contact Derm Group and some other groups that showed that the prevalence in the patch-tested populations of these children is roughly on the order of 25%. That's a significant number. Um, what is also interesting about this data is that when we look at the older studies from the 1980s from Weston, there's about 12 to 13% of children that are sensitized, meaning they are um, their immune system acknowledges the nickel, who are currently not showing signs of contact dermatitis. So at any point um, with an exposure, they could then have a dermatitis. Um, one of the main um, important points in all of this is that uh, a significant proportion of this is preventable. So that's a large number of children who are exposed or sensitized to nickel. Where are they coming in contact with this? Can you comment on perhaps where some of these exposures are and why that number seems to be increasing? Yes. So it's very important to recognize the role of piercing, um, having sustained contact with nickel in earring posts in class is a very, um, very strong um, link with people becoming sensitized, not just in children, but in adults as well. Um, so when we look at the literature, however, there's a, a portion of these children who are not pierced. So we say, where is the clinical relevance of their patch test to this nickel? Where, where are they getting in contact? And the sources are growing daily. I mean, we hear um, new reports coming out. Uh, we recently um, had a study come out on toys. Um, the toys were tested in Denmark and in the US. Uh, the Danish um, toys had a significantly lower percent of nickel, around 20% of the Danish toys, whereas the U.S. toys had over 50% with nickel content. And I was speaking with one of the pediatric dermatologists yesterday on the types of toys. We've seen it from doll's houses, magician rings. Um, we've seen it from, it's not really a toy, but an iPad and, and computer, um, Xbox, uh, those types of devices. But the other um, area that we're seeing it besides in and clothing um, in the toy distribution is actually rattles. It's hard to believe you would give a, a nickel rattle to a baby, but we are seeing the nickel ha rattles having nickel content. So there's a, a large range of sources. Belts are still a major source. Gene snaps have kind of started to phase out. Uh, the VF Corporation, which is your uh, Lee, Wrangler, and uh, a seventh for all mankind uh, jeans um, outfit company, they have phased out nickel use, as has Levi Strauss. So companies are taking and spearheading and really bringing this to the next level, and this is what we want to see. This is great, um, but we still need more of that. So you commented on how the European toys had much less nickel than yes. the U.S. toys, um, and we've spoken at these meetings and elsewhere about the European directive. Can yeah. you speak to that and efforts in the United States that I know you're involved in trying to yeah. help accomplish a similar thing? Yes, yeah, so in, um, in the 1990s and 1980s, um, Europe noticed that they were having a nickel epidemic, and the Danish ministry and the, some Danish dermatologists had taken the lead role and um, brought a nickel directive mandating the, the allowable release of nickel from objects such as piercing posts um, that would be allowed in um, how many micrograms per uh, milligram per week. And that resulted in a huge cost savings. When you look at the Danish study, this is 20 years ago when this was implemented, when you look at the amount they've saved, 
It's on the order of billion, two billion dollars in U.S. currency is the equivalent over 20 years, and they have a 50th of the population we have. When Europe saw this was occurring um, and the the significant decrease in sensitization when this mandate came through um, Denmark, Europe adopted a similar legislation. So we're 20 years out from that, and we don't have that legislation here in the U.S. to pr to protect our constituents. So um, in 2008, we put forth a nickel resolution um, to the AAD that was taken to the AMA that ended up um, in the um, House of Delegates that was then taken to the Consumer Product um, Safety Campaign. Um, and they actually pushed forward. And we, we saw in 2011 a um, voluntary directive on jewelry um, aimed at children. So we have this, but it hasn't been enforced, it hasn't been mandated. And uh, this year in 2015, um, the Nickel Allergy Alliance formed and is in working with, in par with partnership with the American Contact Derm Society and has put forth a new resolution that is asking for a mandatory nickel re regulation. And by regulation is not to remove all nickel. That That's probably not ever going to happen. It's not not practical with with the utility of nickel. Um, however, there are definitely safer uses of nickel. There's safer alloys. We know there's different types of stainless steel, and we need to encourage the safer use of nickel. Um, along that line, the National Eczema Association has endorsed the resolution, and so has NAPIRA. So I know you're involved this meeting. What what are the next steps? Um, that you see us being able yeah. to accomplish. Yes, yeah, so tomorrow is the uh, reference committee hearing at the American Academy of Dermatology across the street. Um, that'll occur at uh, 2 o'clock, and we're hoping for a large voice uh, as we present um, this resolution to ask the AAD to again uh, issue a health advisory on nickel and to encourage the, the legislative bodies that we worked with in the past to um, again push this forward and, and hopefully get to a mandatory um, safety regulation and um, continue to encourage the other societies we're working with. The American um, Academy of Allergy and Immunology uh, and has come on board. Uh, the American College of Allergy and Immunology has come on board and the American Academy of Pediatrics is also putting out a position statement. So um, this is a unified front. It's, uh, it involves di directly impacts patient care and, and again much of this is much nickel sensitization is preventable. Well, thank you very much for that update. As you can see, nickel allergy remains a hot topic in dermatology, hopefully through the efforts spearheaded by uh, Dr. Jacob and the American Contact Derm Society in conjunction with all the other organizations that she mentioned, we can make some headway so that nickel allergy isn't as prevalent here as it currently is.